I'm going to ask that Cynthia and Josh and to me again, <laughs> I can't even speak anymore. Thank you for the blessing and Al, thank you for your leadership. As we come to this time today, um, I ask us to pause. Um, yesterday I received word that Bob Man Monahan had died at Danbury um, Nursing Home and uh, the call came from Jane Carter, his wife, and the rose on the altar today provided by Martha Wilson, thank you Martha, is for Bob and his memory. Today of all days, um, it's good to think of him. Bob and Jane came among us a number of years ago because we were an open and affirming church. Bob's son had died of AIDS and he felt here the warm embrace of a community of faith that loved and accepted not only the two of them, but his son and his memory, and he then gave us his shining light for many, many years. Thanks be to God for the shining light, which was Robert Monaghan. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. A true miracle opens our passage of scripture today. By the oaks of Mamre, God appears to Abraham in a threefold image of the Lord's messengers. Abraham sees these three men, they're literally in the middle of nowhere. And he runs to them and he puts his face down in the dirt and bows to them as low as he can get to the earth. He recognizes that they're messengers of God and their appearance at this sacred oasis known as the Oaks, we now call Hebron, which by the way is the place now where Sarah and Abraham are buried. It is there that he learns the news that he and Sarah are going to have a baby. The hundred-year-old Abraham and his much younger wife, Sarah, at 90, are going to have their firstborn son. This is good news. And Sarah's listening from the tent when she hears the news, and she laughs. That may surprise you that a 90-year-old Sarah laughs when she hears she's going to have a baby any day now, right? It's like, oh, I guess that's good news. <laughs> but we have to remember that it is that laughter that gives her son his name. He's the son of laughter. He's the son of one who laughs. And while I don't want to focus just on the impossibility of this happening, I want us to pause with this thought, that it is never too late to give birth to new life. It is never too late to give birth to new ideas in your life. And you are never too old to welcome new life into your home, into your household, into this world to participate fully in raising a child according to God's plan, not your calendar. So when something happens later in life, you may laugh either before, during, or after it happening, but I want you to always reflect on the deeper meaning because the true meaning of Isaac's name at its depth is one who rejoices. So take that to heart. And from the laughter of Genesis, we move to the powerful testimony of Romans 5. From Abraham and Sarah, we learn endurance and patience and joy in the long wait and walk for the arrival of their son, Isaac. From Paul, we learn how to trust God through Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that in Jesus, we receive what God has always wanted us to have, someone who will make things right in our lives. He says, we throw open our doors to God and discover at the very same moment that God has already thrown open his doors to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand and then in the wide open spaces of God's grace and God's glory, standing tall and shouting our praise, we speak of God. But there's more that comes. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how patience can then turn a forge of steel into virtue. 
and can keep us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left alone in our shortcomings. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything that God generously is pouring out into our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here is what I really love. In the words of Eugene Peterson in the message, we read this in five verses six through eight. Christ arrives on time to make this happen. He didn't and he doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presents himself for this sacrificial death when we are far too weak and far too rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready for it. And even if we hadn't been weak, we still would not have been aware of how to prepare for him. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to self, selfless sacrifice. But God, as Al read so beautifully, puts his love on the line for us by offering us his son in a sacrificial death while we were truthfully no help to God before. He turns us into helpers. I love that. We have God arriving in surprise and joy in Genesis through the power of perseverance and disappointment. And then in Romans, we have hope arriving in Jesus Christ's promise and self-sacrifice. And the deep lesson for each of us is that affliction does produce endurance and endurance does produce character and character does produce hope and hope never disappoints us. Hope never disappoints us. And he arrives on time. And Matthew tells us really what this is all about. He sort of brings it all together. In the words of Jesus Christ, superstar, Jesus tells us what's the buzz. He tells us what's really happening. It's about a teacher and a preacher and a healer who steps into the world and sees every single person in the crowd and has a love for them and a heart of compassion for them and truly wraps them around with his love. Why? Because he sees that they have been harassed, that they've been helpless in the face of hardships in their lives. Warren Carter, in his masterful commentary on Matthew entitled, Matthew and the Margins, a socio-political and religious reading, writes this of Jesus' words, helpless and harassed. He says, Jesus saw the crowds suffering from violence. Harassed in this context meant a flaying, a, a violence, a plundering of them. And helpless meant a throwing down, a laying down, often in very violent contexts, including abandonment, imperial violence, war and death, or destruction and judgment. Carter concludes, Jesus sees people who are oppressed and downtrodden and beat up and crushed, and he sees us when we are too. And what does he do in the face of all this? He has compassion. It's somewhere out of the depths of his gut, somewhere deep inside, he has compassion. He reaches out and expresses his love and mercy for everyone. He acts out of a merciful love. And then after loving them and showing them healing and merciful actions, he turns to his disciples and says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so get out of here. Go spread good news. He doesn't actually say get out of here, but he does say go spread good news. Jesus' response to all this pain and trauma is not despair, but prayers. He says, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers into his harvest. He turns to the disciples. He sends them out. It's really very interesting, by the way. I don't know if you listen carefully, but he said, whatever you do, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, which is fascinating to me because Jesus did. But it's almost like they're still young ones in learning how to be disciples. And he goes, I don't think you can handle that yet. Just go to the people you know and start there, and that will be a very meaningful ministry for you. So he sends them out to the ones they know. And when he does, he sends them out in the fullness of his love. And, he sit, and I think he sings a song, actually. I think it goes something like a Start spreading the news. You're leaving today. I want you all to be a part of it in Galilee. I know I can't get a solo now, Josh, after that. But 
I think he heard that from someone, Jesus did, and he just put the words to the music that was in him. So anyway, we may hear that tune again for some other words later in life, but there it was. Nice tune, Jesus. Maybe it'll be a hit someday. He sends them out. He tells them to spread the word, to do acts of love and mercy, to have compassion for all the people who have been harassed and who are helpless. This is not some sort of mumbo jumbo. This is the call to discipleship that is real for each one of us as well. Yesterday, some of us were in a parade with more than 28,000 people. And some of us were watching over the 28,000 who were marching. Your fellow church members represented the first church group well in this parade. And when our little band of pilgrims walked past the 700,000 on the parade route, whom some of you were in that part of the crowd as well, we were blown away by the reception and the love that came flowing back to each and every one of us. It was truly a spiritual and remarkable experience. It moved me, and I know it moved each of us deeply. I made a point, as much as I could, of making eye contact with as many people as possible. And what I saw thousands of times, in thousands of eyes, was love. I saw love. They cheered for us mightily when our signs went by, and they particularly loved the dancing pastor who had the same soul on as a matter of fact. She was dancing in that green. And she had this protect our trans youth sign. And the crowd was going nuts. And the one that you made that I held up was protect our trans children and youth. And again, eyes were on us and cheers were around us because love was spoken from the first church group. And I'm very proud what Lynn said is true, that we were the first church to be there, and that was touching to me. But there we were yesterday. I felt more love than I felt anywhere in a long, long time. It was palpable, it was promising, it was good. It felt good to be on the streets with 700,000 of my new closest friends. <laughs> so, all seeking love, all seeking to live compassion and kindness and merciful and loving ways as they were fighting for justice in our city in our state and in our nation. There are so many lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer and questioning, asexual, and many others who use terms like non-binary, pansexual, and others who describe their experiences of gender, sexuality, and physiological sex characteristics different than you and I do. Every one of us needs love, and every one of us does not need judgment. I want to tell you, there were a few signs yesterday that said that Jesus actually was judging people. And all I could say is, if I had been able to shout across the avenue, but I think Mike Kennedy kept me from yelling at the crowd. <laughs> but if I had been able to shout, I would have said, read your Bible. It's just not true. You guys haven't even read your Bible, and you're making these declarations. It's wrong. But you know what? Those folks were surrounded by this band, literally this band of love that was in front of them. So their voices were very tiny. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Their voices were small because their thoughts are small. And the largeness of love that was there overwhelmed the hate. So. I want you to start spreading the news. You're leaving today. Oh, Josh is leaving today. <laughs> the rest of you aren't leaving. You're leaving today. You're gonna go out today from any barn of despair you were in before to a house of hope. You're gonna leave your smaller world which holds you back from fuller love. You're gonna leave your universe of judgment. You're gonna enter God's universe of compassionate love. You're gonna leave whatever it has been in your life that's been holding you back from really living and loving and coming out to love, coming out of your shell, your preconceived notions, all of your prejudices, just get rid of them. They're unnecessary. They don't help. This is the day which God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it and go out in this day. 
don't hold back, to go into the world in understanding and love. On the eve of Juneteenth, and on, in the heart of a father for Father's Day, I leave you with these thoughts. Now you're gonna have to choke deep because I'm gonna name a number that you're all gonna say, please don't do this. But I have 25 thoughts. <laughs> 25 thoughts. 25 pieces of love that I learned from my father, that I learned from Paul and Jesus. They're tried and true. They've never been said here. But nine years ago when I preached the last time ever in front of my dad on his 90th birthday, I shared them with the congregation in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. So I share them with you now in memory and in honor of my father. Maybe some will grab hold of your soul. Maybe some will influence your relationship with God and with others. Here they are. Offer your everyday, ordinary life to God. Take hold of what God does for you as the best thing that you can do for God. Don't become so comfortable in this culture that you fit in without thinking about what you're doing. Instead, fix your focus on God. God will change you from the inside out. Ask every single day, what would God have me do in this situation that I'm in? And then respond to it and do the right thing. Remember, God always brings out the best in us. Be thankful every day in every way to God for all the blessings of your life. And stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop complaining about your life. Live in the pure grace of God. Be generous and compassionate. Let your love be genuine. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil and hold on for dear life to what is good. Be a good friend and love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled and aflame. Be cheerful and expectant. Don't quit in hard times, but pray to God all the harder. Help people who are in need be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies and remember no cursing under your breath today or really any day. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy and cry with them when they're down. Get along with everybody. Don't get stuck on yourself. You are never as good or as bad as all of that. Make friends with those who others, others treat as nobody and don't try to be the great somebody. Don't hit back when you're hurt. That includes words they can hurt too. Discover beauty within everyone. And if you've got it in you, get along with them. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. Remember what God said, I'll take care of the judging. I'll get even for you. Remember also what our scriptures tell us. When you see your enemy hungry, buy him a lunch. When you see her thirsty, get her a drink. And generosity will surprise them, and it will surprise you. Do not let evil ever get the best of you. Get the best of evil with good. The sermon opened with a miracle, and I pray that it closes with one as well. May the miracle of God's love alive within you spread to others as you start spreading the news. Amen.